German factory builds one of the world's most famous cars. The 911 is the icon of the sports car industry. It's the shape, it's the engine in the back, it's the feel it gives you, it's the emotion. The factory runs like a precision machine, building hundreds of engines a day. The product and our manufacturing process are one unit, and that's our secret of success. Automation, technology, and skilled human labor combined to build 16 versions of the Porsche 911, including the 911 GT3. Lots of our customers, they want a race car, and they want a race car that they can use on the normal street as well. The Porsche 911 has been made for more than four decades on the same grounds in Stuttgart, Germany, at Porsche's ultimate factory. nimble, and always powered by a flat six-cylinder engine in the back of the car. Automotive journalists say the 911 may offer the ideal connection between car and driver. The 911 is like a glove that fits you perfectly. The car communicates very directly what it's doing, so it's a, a very emotional driving experience to have a 911 under you. That emotional experience is tempered with practicality. You can go to your groceries with the car, you can go shopping. You can use it during the week, going to work. And if going to work involves commuting on parts of the Autobahn without a speed limit, all the better. There are 16 models of the 911. One of the newest 911s is the GT3. It's designed with one mission in mind. The GT3 is a track tool. It's the ultimate track day weapon. The GT3 is designed for the growing number of auto enthusiasts who race their cars on closed tracks. The thrill of owning your own street legal race car will cost you $112,000. The GT3 six-cylinder engine delivers 435 horsepower. It catapults the GT3 from zero to 60 miles per hour in four seconds taking it to a top speed of up to 194 miles per hour. It feels more like a race car than a street-going car. Actually, it's a race car with a street-legal tag on it. Since 1964, every 911 ever built has been made in Porsche's ultimate factory in Stuttgart, Germany. The factory consists of several industrial buildings that are linked together. The car's body shell gets its color in the paint shop. The 911's famous flat six-cylinder engine is built in the engine assembly building. Leather work for the car's interior is handcrafted in the upholstery shop. Finally, all the pieces come together in the vehicle assembly building with its 117 assembly stations. The factory builds all 16 models of the 911, plus two Porsche Boxster models on the same assembly line. Every day we build approximately 40 Boxsters and about 110 Porsche 911s. The 911's body begins in the body shell assembly building. 
outside the body shop, stamp steel body panels are standing by. Inside 105 robots, along with teams of skilled welders, fuse the car's frame together. The frame is made of three sub-assemblies. The front compartment, the mid-floor pan, and the rear compartment. Each sub-assembly is welded together from stamped steel parts. This welder spot welds the front compartment of the frame, while this welder works on the rear compartment. The front compartment is then sent off to be joined with the rear compartment. When the mid-floor pan is added, clamps hold the three pieces in place. Then the robot welds them together, making them one. A team of human welders places a shield between them to protect against sparks and glare. They reinforce the job. Welding seams robots cannot reach. At this point, every 911 frame on the line is identical. But all that changes at the geometry station. where the various model rear side panels are welded onto the vehicle. Here, the car becomes a hardtop or a convertible cabriolet. Since this car is destined to be a hardtop, robots ensure it gets a roof. When the welding is done, another group of robots attacks the frame. This time, not to weld, but to pierce it. Hundreds of rivets and screw holes will allow technicians to attach components to the body later in the assembly process. Next, robots select doors and weld door hinges to the frame. Almost 5,000 welds later, the robotic work is done in the body shop. Now, workers place the metal body panels that gives the 911 its unmistakable front shape. It starts with the front quarter panels. And at the next station, the luggage compartment cover or hood. Now the body shell is complete. Even in this raw form, the body has the iconic shape of the classic Porsche 911. A shape that has been world famous for more than 40 years. When the 911 was launched for the first time in 1964, the design was almost shocking, or you could say very much ahead of the time. In that time, the Porsche 911 has seen evolution in its design, but never revolution. There may be no other car that has changed so little in appearance during the course of several decades. It may surprise some to learn that this high-end sports car's beginnings can be traced to another famous but much more humble car.
the origins of the Porsche 911's iconic shape and design can be sourced to a more modest vehicle. The Volkswagen Beetle and the brilliance of a man named Ferdinand Porsche. Ferdinand Porsche was very much ahead of his time. He was a technical genius. Ferdinand Porsche was a self-taught automotive designer and engineer. In 1900, at the age of 25, he designed the world's first hybrid gasoline electric car for an Austrian company. He also spent more than a decade designing cars for Mercedes. By the 1930s, Ferdinand Porsche had formed his own company designing cars for other manufacturers. He sold the German government on his dream of a small, simple car that would be affordable to the masses. That car eventually became the Volkswagen Beetle. After World War II, Ferdinand Porsche's son, Ferry Porsche, took control of the company. Ferry Porsche wanted a sports car, not for the general public, but for his own driving pleasure. A post-war shortage of parts forced Ferry Porsche to use components from the Volkswagen Beetle. The rear-mounted air-cooled four-cylinder engine, the gearbox, and the suspension. Ferry Porsche modified everything to make it more sporty. The car that emerged in 1948 was the Porsche 356. More than 75,000 were made over the course of 15 years. It was the first sports car to bear the Porsche name. In the late 1950s, Ferry Porsche wanted a new sports car. This time, he insisted on a more powerful six-cylinder engine. For the new car's physical design, Ferry Porsche turned to his oldest son, known as Bootsy Porsche. He realized the perfect uh, successor of the Porsche 356 because uh, he used the classic design line of, it, of the car, but he moved it in a very forward uh, way. The result was presented in 1963 and eventually was called the 911. Over the course of four decades, the design was updated just five times, resulting in six generations of 911s. I think the design carries on because uh, Porsche always understood very well what you have to do to bring the 911 design language into the future. Now, the unpainted body shells descended from the first 911s built in 1964 are ready to leave the body shop to be painted. The trouble is, the body shop and the paint shop have a four-lane road separating them. So how does the body shell move from the body shop to the paint shop? A bridge. This bridge uh, is uh, going over one of the most used streets in Stuttgart. It takes about a half hour for a body shell to travel 94 yards over the bridge to the paint shop. The paint shop's first step is a car wash that removes dirt and grease. Bodies are then blow dried to remove any lingering dust. Once the surface is clinically clean, it heads into a paint bath containing almost 16,000 gallons of paint. The bath holds an anti-corrosion paint called cathodic dip primer. The cathodic dip primer is electrically charged positive. The metal carrier that holds the car carries a negative charge. As the car is submerged, the carrier agitates the car, 
making sure the positively charged paint is drawn to every part of the negatively charged body. When the car emerges from the bath, the bond of the paint is so strong that excess paint can be washed off with water. Now the car heads into a dryer for 30 minutes to cure the cathodic dipped paint. A single speck of dust can ruin a paint job, which is why technicians dust the body before the primer coat. The interior of the car is primed by human painters. The exterior is where the robots take over. The primer is electrically charged positive. As the robots atomize the paint into the air, the paint is attracted to the car's negatively charged surface. It may look like the color coat, but it's not. The primer can be one of five colors, white, light gray, dark gray, yellow, or red. The selected primer color is the closest match to the color coat. With the primer complete, the car heads into a 338 degree Fahrenheit dryer for 30 minutes. Now, it's time for the car to get its color coat. The most popular colors for a Porsche are black, white, red. Porsche offers 12 standard colors, plus nine premium colors. But for a fee, Porsche will custom paint your car any color you want. Because of the number of colors offered by the factory, the color coat is painted by hand. Painters are trained to paint the body from front to back, beginning with the top before moving to the sides. It takes three years of training before a painter is allowed to spray the color coat onto the cars. Ventilation systems supply clean air through the painter's masks as they spray the water-based paint. In all, over a gallon of paint is applied depending on the color. With the color coat complete, the 911 heads into a 320 degree Fahrenheit dryer to cure the paint. The final layer is a solvent-based clear coat. The clear coat is painted by robots because the same clear coat is used for every car. The robot is also programmed to open the doors of the car and coat the interior surfaces. The paint shop's final job is putting the Porsche logo on the vehicle's hood. In all, it takes eight hours for a 911 to enter the paint shop as a steel shell and exit a painted car. Now, preparations are underway to build the vehicle's six-cylinder heart. From the very beginning, since 1964, the heart of the Porsche 911 has always been a six-cylinder engine. But not just any six-cylinder engine. Six-cylinder engines come in three major types. Some are straight sixes. The most common six-cylinder engines are V6s. The Porsche 911 has always used an engine known as a flat six-cylinder. 
with two rows of three cylinders horizontally opposed to each other. Porsche believes there is a key advantage to the flat six design when used in its sports cars. The biggest advantage of uh, using a flat six cylinder in the, uh, in the Porsche 911 is its low center of gravity uh, because it's very small that you can mount it down low in the body. The lower center of gravity contributes to improved handling. The lower the center of gravity is, the more stable the car is at high speeds in the cornering. Those famous flat six-cylinder engines are made in the factory's engine assembly area. In Stuttgart, we build in total approximately 500 engines per day. Every three minutes, the plant completes a flat six engine. The plant makes more than 20 different versions of its flat six cylinder engine, ranging from 255 to 535 horsepower. Each version of the flat six cylinder engine has many of its own specific parts. The challenge is getting the right parts to the right place, just in time for the engine's assembly. So Porsche developed an automated logistics system. In the logistics building, a computer illuminates lights near the parts bins, indicating to a worker which parts to pick. Once the part is picked, the worker pulls a string, shutting off the light. Engine parts are loaded onto a cart. The cart is then picked up by Porsche's patented driverless transport system. Carts are programmed to take a specific route to the engine assembly area. The route takes them over a bridge and into an elevator, where they go down one floor and deliver the parts to the engine assembly area just in time. The factory has a total of 21 carts. Nine of the carts are dedicated to removing completed engines from the engine assembly area. The carts take the finished engines back up to the logistics area. But how do the carts know where to go and which path to take? Every five meters, we have magnets embedded in the floor, which are covered by concrete. And between one five meter distance and the next five meters, the cart is programmed to find its way. This, for example, is such a spot. Each cart travels over 12 miles every day at speeds of over three miles per hour. The people on the floor seem to know how to stay out of the cart's way. But just in case, there are safeguards. As we can see, nothing happens even though it's carrying a heavy load and these carts move at quite a high speed. But nothing can happen because we have a built-in safety system in there. For every flat six cylinder engine made, there are three parts deliveries to the assembly floor. The first parts delivery is pushed by hand. It contains both halves of the crankcase, the crankshaft, and pistons. Early in the line, pistons are assembled. Then the first three pistons are carefully put into the crankcase. Then, the crankshaft is placed into one of the crankcase halves. 
that first row of pistons is linked to the crankshaft. Then, a robot installs the second half of the crankcase and bolts it on. Now, the partially assembled engine travels to the main engine assembly line. Meeting that partially assembled engine, a special carrier called a cross member. The cross member allows technicians to maneuver the engine for easier assembly. You can rotate the engine, you can lift and lower the engine, so that the workman always works in an optimal ergonomic position. Two stations down, a technician puts the cross member to work, flipping the engine on its side and installing the remaining three piston heads. The technician cranks the engine to check the piston linkages with the crankshaft, ensuring the operation is smooth. Next, a cylinder head is placed onto one side of the engine. The cylinder head contains valves that will let air into the cylinders and take exhaust out. Technicians put the cross member to work again, flipping the engine, so the other cylinder head can be installed. Every two minutes and 44 seconds, the engine reaches a new station. Some stations are manned by human beings. Others are handled by robots. Automation makes sense in those places where many things are repeated. If you screw 20 screws into an oil pan, it's not necessary that one employee screws in 20 screws. A robot can do that. That doesn't achieve any added value. But if you have complex assembly procedures, you need the employee. About two thirds of the way through the line, every engine goes through what's known as a cold test. Here, the engine is electrically cranked and turned. Its linkages and systems are checked by computer. After the test, the intake manifold is installed. The engine will breathe in its air through these plastic tubes. The engine exhales through the exhaust manifold, the last major part installed. It's taken about six hours to build the flat six engine from start to finish. At the end of the line, completed engines are taken away by the driverless transport carts and delivered to a holding area. They'll eventually be taken to the main assembly line and married to the vehicle's body. At Porsche's ultimate factory in Stuttgart, Germany, the assembly line puts together 16 different models of the 911. Each 911 will spend about 15 hours moving down the line. The line has 117 assembly stations. Workers at each station have just over five minutes to complete their tasks before the next car moves into place. But as they work, the line does not stop. The line is moving continuously so the technicians can keep working and don't have to stop during the feed. Now, a painted body shell enters the main assembly line. Station 1. The 911's new paint job is protected with pads. 
Then the doors come off to allow easier access to the inside of the car throughout the assembly process. At station two, technicians snake wiring through the car, laying down the network for the electrical system. Station six, the first upholstered item is put in the car, the cockpit, which includes the leather dash. At Porsche, leather begins as tanned cow hides in the upholstery shop. The basic 911 has 40 upholstered pieces, including the dash, door panels, and seats. It takes six hides to upholster an average 911. Hides are laid out on a machine that automatically cuts the pieces to be upholstered, while avoiding flaws in the leather. The machine uses a powerful water jet to cut the leather. The pressure coming out of the nozzle is over 43,000 pounds per square inch, about 30 times the pressure of a power washer used to clean buildings. The machine is done, and now the pieces are collected. The first workers to get their hands on the cut leather are the sewers, who stitch pieces together. Next, a robot sprays the stitched leather with glue. Then, a craftsperson has the painstaking task of fitting the leather to the dashboard frame. Heat makes the leather more pliable and workable. It also keeps the glue tacky. The first challenge is fitting the seam in the frame's groove. Then, the leather has to be stretched over the top of the dash. Once the fit is right, he trims the excess leather with a knife and rounds the remaining material under the dash. A little pressure with a sand-filled weight smooths out any ripples and completes the job an hour after it began. The upholstered dashboards are sent to a pre-assembly area just a few yards from the main assembly line. Here, they are built up into full cockpit assemblies, including gauges and steering columns. Once assembled, the cockpit is the first upholstered piece installed on the car. Six assembly stations are complete. The car's journey down the line is just beginning with the most challenging assembly processes ahead. Porsche's ultimate 911 factory in Stuttgart, Germany has 117 assembly stations. Some stations are where 911s get parts that differentiate them from other 911 variants. One popular variant is the Targa. A 911 with a retractable glass top. If the 911 arriving at station 14 is a Targa, this is where technicians install the huge glass top. Almost 115 pounds of glass hangs in the balance as technicians try to slide it in through the back end of the car, forming both the car's roof and rear window.
down the line at Station 18. The assembly area's only robot installs the windshield. First, it applies glue to the inside of the glass. This robot works in the dark because of its infrared sensors, which help it position the windshield to tolerances of nearly two hundredths of an inch. Station 30. If the 911 coming down the line is a GT3, this is where technicians install the prominent rear wing. Airplanes use wings to create lift, enabling the aircraft to fly. The GT3's wing is angled to do the opposite, to keep the car on the ground. The faster a car goes, the more lift it creates, and we have to overcome that lift and push the car down on the street again, because that's what makes the car controllable. Just a few stations down the line, Station 34. The name of the 911 model is spelled out for the... The 911's two radiators are installed in front of the car. Hoses cycle coolant to the rear where the engine will be located. The engine those radiators will cool arrives on the assembly floor near the halfway point on the line. Technicians connect the engine and transmission to a pre-assembly that also includes the suspension, brakes, and axles. It's all in advance of the most dramatic moment on the line, the marriage of the powertrain and body. The Porsche 911 is famous for both its iconic shape and its rear-mounted flat six-cylinder engine. Now at Porsche's ultimate factory in Stuttgart, Germany, that body and engine are about to come together midway down the assembly line at Station 61. The joining of the body and powertrain assembly is called a marriage. It's a major moment on the line. The entire car that's been built up coming down the line is now bolted to the suspension and powertrain. Even so, it's like any other station on the line. Technicians must accomplish the task in about five minutes. Then they get to do it again and again. The 
The 911's engine is in place, although many would say in an unusual place. It's one of the few cars made today with an engine mounted in the rear. The main advantage of having an engine in the rear of the car is the traction, huh? because uh, the engine it sits right on top of the driven wheels. It gives you a lot of traction, so you can put a lot of power to the street uh, without uh, having to fear for wheel spins, uh, which is not efficient. Station 83. Signs the end of the line is nearing as fluids for air conditioning, brakes and power steering are added. But if the end is near, the car will need its wheels and tires. They're at station 98. Tires are fitted to the wheels just before installation. All five lug nuts are torqued at once. Unless it's a 911 GT3, its wheels use a special center lock. The center lock system is used on race cars because it allows for faster tire changes. Porsche is the first company that uh, offers a center lock wheel on a street legal car. The factory uses a special tool just to torque the center locks on GT3 wheels. With wheels in place, the cars seem ready to roll. But not quite. If the car heading into Station 103 is a cabriolet, it's still missing one crucial piece, the soft top. The 911 Cabriolet soft top opens and closes in just 20 seconds. The end of the line is approaching. Station 110. The doors that came off at the very beginning of the line now get put back on. And at station 113, workers install the last major parts, the upholstered seats. Now, the car is fueled with more than five gallons of gasoline. Then, it started for the first time. The first roll test simulates a bumpy road. Then, another roll test takes the car up to speeds of 75 miles per hour. The final inspection takes about two hours. Then the cars leave the factory. A transport truck will now take them to a shipping depot where they'll eventually end up at dealerships around the world. For more than 40 years, Porsche's Stuttgart factory has been turning out cars with this iconic shape. Just as the 911 has evolved, so have the factory's manufacturing processes. But if workers from the past could see almost a half century into the future, they might be surprised to find today's workers building a car that looks remarkably similar.
any generation of workers on the production line can take pride knowing they have built one of the world's most famous sports cars, more than 40 years running. Porsche's factory in Stuttgart, Germany is an ultimate factory.